Good morning, Bewitchlings. This is Tiffany on Bewitching Bemused. First of all, thank you so much for tolerating my hiatus. I really appreciate your patience. I was very busy with the wedding and honeymoon and then holidays started and it's still going. But anyway, we're back. Today though, I want to talk about how to use creativity to enhance your spell work. So firstly, we'll cover what purpose that creativity serves in spell work. Like what can it actually do for your spell work and why does it benefit your craft? And then we'll go over uh, various different ways that you can incorporate creativity into your practice. So first, what purpose does it serve? When you're talking about incorporating creativity into something, oftentimes this involves a use of time, energy, and care that is required in that practice of the creative pursuit along with whatever ritual or spell you are trying to implement. In addition to that, that time, energy, and care can also be used as a sort of an offering or a sacrifice to spirit if you are choosing to work with spirit. So when I talk about this uh, dedication of time and energy, it's a matter of, yes, those quick little charms where you, you get some store-bought incense, you charge it up with an intention, and then you light it, you visualize your intention for a few moments, and then you move on with your life. Those are great. They do serve their time and their purpose, and don't get me wrong, uh, those do make up a good chunk of my day-to-day -day practice because they are so quick, so simple, and so effortless. Those quick and easy practices can work well and be very effective as a supplemental practice to a bigger ritual or for just a quick little helping hand during your day. However, you can't expect life altering changes or a massive dramatic manifestation off of something that you kind of just quickly threw together and performed in less than two minutes. Now, when I said it was a simple spell, you know, charging up that store-bought incense and lighting it, I don't mean simple in terms of a lack of ingredients or a lack of an incantation. That sort of simplicity, I think, can do wonders and it can be highly effective in spell work. No, earlier when I said simple, I mean in terms, again, of time, energy, and care that you are dedicating to this practice and to this ritual or spell. How can you expect to get huge results out if you're only putting small efforts in? Typically though, when you create something, when you make something, you have to put in, what are the three words I've been repeating? Time, effort, and care. What is it? T-E-C, time, effort, care. So when you are making something, you are adding the energy of that T-E-C into this working, into whatever you are creating for this working. That energy is helping to amplify your manifestation. It's helping to feed your manifestation. It's helping to send it out. And like I mentioned earlier, this dedication of time is a sacrifice. You are giving up your time to create something. And so if you are petitioning spirit, whether that is a deity, whether that's, um, you know, ancestors, whether that's land spirits, etc., you can use this as a sort of offering to them to help assist you in this working. The next reason is personalization. And I go over this a lot in my article, Demystifying Magical Correspondences. I will link it down below. And I've talked about that in a few different videos. This again is about lending your own energy to your working. But when you personalize your spells and rituals, you are linking your mind to your ritual, to your manifestation. You may already know what sympathetic magic is. If you don't, sympathetic magic is the practice of linking what you are trying to manifest to the materials and the motions that you are using, the words that you are saying. You are uh, playing out how you want something to manifest, what it is you want to manifest in a symbolic nature, right? So a really good example of this is you have two candles, you tie them together with a cord, you light both of them and you let them burn down and eventually they'll burn through that cord. And one of those candles is meant to be you and another one of those candles is meant to be somebody in your life who you are trying to get rid of or you are trying to get rid of their influence over you. So you are breaking that cord, right? It's, it's very obvious symbolism in this one. Some is a little bit more ambiguous, a little bit more um, metaphorical. That one, you know, usually you also have your names carved into the candles. So it's a little bit more obvious, but that's what sympathetic magic is. So depending on the ritual that you're doing and the method of magic that you're practicing, everything from your motions, you know, movements that you do, 
to your ingredients, to the words that you're saying, like I said earlier, are likely symbolic for the things you're trying to manifest. That's why we have ingredients that are correspondences or they correspond, right, to certain intentions. That's also why we have certain motions, like uh, moving clockwise is to draw something in. Moving counter or anti-clockwise is to send something away. Um, same with, you know, right hand, left hand, or folding something towards you is bringing it in. Anointing a candle towards you is bringing it in, whereas banishment, it would always be moving away from you. The more that your spell suits the symbolic purposes for you, the stronger the association between your actions, your ritual, and your desired result will be. So when it comes to using creativity to enhance your spell work, okay, say that a spell calls for writing an incantation and speaking it aloud, but you're maybe you're one of those people who doesn't like writing. You don't you have so much trouble finding the right words. It feels, you, you can do it, but it would take some time and it always feels kind of clumpy, clunk, clunky. You don't feel like maybe you're the most poetic person in the world. That's fine. Maybe you're more of, a, of, a, of an illustrator. You know, you would rather draw a picture of what you would essentially be saying in your manifestation. You would draw a picture of, of this spell coming to life and bringing your results to you because that is going to be much more personal to bring your spells to life. Next up is focused intent. So I've got this neighbor. I feel like I'm cursed with always having at least one really bad neighbor, not just slightly annoying, not just slightly mildly inconvenient. I mean like a really bad, bothersome neighbor. So I do have one right now. So last month I did create a batch, a small batch of black salt that I used and I specifically thought of him and how much I don't like him, how uncomfortable he makes me, um, negative interactions I've had with him. I focused on those while I was making it and on just wanting to send him away, hopefully avoid him at the very least, but preferably I, I would like him to just move somewhere else and be someone else's problem. But that particular batch of black salt has that very specific intention bound into it, right? So black salt in general is good for casting away. It's for banishing. It's for protection, deflection, things like that. Um, that's, but that's all sort of general. When I thought about my neighbor, I made it very, very specific. I will talk about this just like a little bit more in a later section, but I just wanted to point out how impactful it can be when all of the, or at least some of the ingredients that you're using don't just have general associations, general correspondences, but very specific ones. Like, yes, it's, it's perfectly fine uh, to take a general ingredient and then charge it up with a specific intention. I do this all the time. It's very impactful, but to create it again, lending that time, effort, care, you're lending that in and you're considering the very specific reason you're going to be using this and the very specific outcome that you want from performing this spell and using this ingredient in that spell, it can really boost and amplify what you're working on. The final reason that you might want to use creativity in your spell work to enhance your spell work is for the purposes of gnosis and indifferent vacuity. So sometimes the creation process is in fact the spell. I do discuss this a little bit more in my introductory video to chaos magic, but gnosis is an altered state of mind. It's most commonly used um, in general practice anyway. It's most commonly used for charging sigils. And of course, sigils are not the only thing that can be empowered through the practice of gnosis. So I want you to take a moment and think about a memory of a time that you were working on an art project or some sort of whatever creative pursuit it is that you personally enjoy. Have you ever been so wrapped up in it that somebody was calling your name from another room and you did not hear them? They either had to come in and tap you on the shoulder or it wasn't until like the fifth or sixth time that they called your name. Or you're, you're so wrapped up in what you're doing that like the entire world and every thought in your mind just completely melts away. Practicing an art or a creative pursuit can often be almost meditative. And so that is one big benefit is that art and creativity, the practice of these can lead to gnosis and indifferent vacuity almost effortless, effortlessly. 
So how can you incorporate creativity into your craft, especially if you are one of many people who's just not a super artistic or creative person? I will have certain artistic and creative pursuits in this list, but I also have some things that I know that some people just don't dedicate much time to that sort of thing. They've maybe never picked up an artistic pursuit as a hobby, and that's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Not all of us sort of lean that way. Um, so some of these are more geared towards people who maybe don't have a specific craft or hobby that, or uh, art form, what have you, that they practice. So this is how you can still incorporate creativity into your craft. So the first one, and probably the most obvious one, is to make your own spells. Most obvious, but probably also the most effective. So this goes kind of back to that section where I talked about personalization. I discussed why making a spell your own can provide beneficial impact. I do have a whole video on making uh, your own spells. I will link it down below in the description box. But even if you're a newer practitioner, and maybe you don't quite feel comfortable with completely writing your own spell from scratch, that's fine. You can take a pre-written spell, something from a book, something you got on Reddit or Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and just rewrite it. If, you know, rewrite the incantation to make it suit your specific situation. Um, if some of the ingredients don't quite look right to you or you don't have them on hand, find uh, put and put effort into this. Don't just toss things out and add things in all willy-nilly or off of a single Google search of what corresponds with this. Um, but put some time and effort in, but replace some ingredients. Take some out, add other ones in. Same with any motions. If it says walk five feet to the north and you're wondering why, <laughs> maybe find another symbolic gesture or motion or behavior that would serve the same purpose that you believe the spell writer creator was trying to convey with that, but that works for you. I've already mentioned sigils, but yes, sigils. I will link my video on creating and charging your own sigils down below in the description box because it is way too much to fit into this video. But I do want to say that one theory when it comes to sigils, um, which is the process of taking a um, your intention and converting it into an abstract image, is that what you are doing is you're taking your intention from your conscious mind, where you're consciously thinking the words and visualizing the things that you want, and you're converting it into something that translates better in the subconscious mind, where the powering of that manifestation is actually triggered. So that's sort of one prevailing theory on why sigils work. I am vastly oversimplifying it, but anyway, the link to that video is down below. Next is collaging or vision boards. This is something that even non-practitioners do all the time and recommend all the time. Um, it's something that I know I like to do every new year. I go onto canva.com because it's mostly free. I create a collage of everything I'm trying to manifest that year. And then I actually set it as the, the desktop background for both my PC and my laptop. So I'm seeing it all the time. You know, I'm sort of uh, using like the law of attraction by thinking of it consistently, thinking of it positively every time I kind of just glance at it. Either it's just a little floating quick thought or sometimes I'll kind of look at it and study it and constantly be reminded to be working towards those goals or studying it and kind of visualizing it more in depth and sending that out into the universe. It is also just helpful to have a physical visual image of what it is you're working on. Now, I find that vision boards work best as a uh, supplemental to a bigger working, but they also work better for long-term goals because you know, it's just, a, you're doing a little bit, just a little bit at a time. Yes, there is the creation process, but every time you see it, it's just lending a little bit more energy, a little bit more energy. So it's good to kind of allow that to build up over time. So I wouldn't do this for something that I need manifested next week. I wouldn't bother, but that's just kind of my personal experience with vision boards. It is different for everybody. So do what works for you. Also, they do make really nice altar decor if you decide to make a physical version or if you wanna print off uh, one that you made on your computer or online. Next is handcrafting spell items. I did mention handcrafting ingredients, the specific intent, focused intent on those, but that's not your only option when it comes to creating things to be used in your spell um, that are kind of ingredients based. 
um, with that focused intent. In addition to ingredients that are going to be used in your ritual, you may also want to consider things that you can make that will be used more in the long term, right? So recently I did a candle spell for fertility. Now, in addition to that, I also made a fertility charm bag. While I did the candle spell, because this was a multi-day spell and ritual, um, I had the charm bag sitting next to it, so it was getting charged up as I was doing this ritual. And then once that was done, I took it and I put it on my, mine and my husband's um, headboard. And so it's sitting right above our bed where fertility would be most needed. But putting that charm bag together, it took time. It took effort. I uh, put a lot of care into it, considering which items go in, which items, you know, I like to collect a bunch of items and then kind of decide what do I feel is the most impactful. I don't like to just be like, here's 15, 20 items I can fit in here. It's not always the more the merrier, right? Sometimes you need to just whittle it down to the ones with the strongest associations or the most specific associations and add them in. But anyway, I'm getting off track. Charm bags are one example. Another one would be uh, poppets or dolls, a uh, witch ball, witch's ladder, and of course, uh, jewelry that are amulets or talismans. And those are just a few examples. Um, there's lots of things that you can make and you can hang in your house or put in your car or wear on your person that will add to your working, whether it's protection, fertility, wealth, what have you. And it will work more long term. Uh, say jars, jars as well. Um, those are another great example of something that you're taking time to make. You're making it yourself. And I know a lot of us go, hey, I already do that. Well, keep doing it because putting that energy into that, that time into it. Remember I mentioned earlier, time, effort, care is so, so important. Then we have kitchen witchery. I think a lot of people overlook cooking as not being a creative pursuit. Um, especially if you're like me, I am not, Okay, I like cooking, but I definitely have to stick to a recipe. I am not a person who can really improvise, like maybe a little bit, but I'm not somebody who really improvises in the kitchen because I don't know enough about what I'm doing. <laughs> so obviously if you can create your own recipe or especially if you can make all of your ingredients from scratch, yes, I'm. there is bonus points for that, definitely. But even just the practice of general kitchen witchery is a very creative pursuit in and of itself because you are creating something, right? Next is painting and drawing. Whether you are painting oil on a giant canvas or you are drawing up, sketching up a three panel comic, these and everything in between are great ways to manifest your intentions by creating a visual element of what it is you want to happen or perhaps your life after you have received the benefits of your labors, right? You're after your, your spell has come to fruition. Along that same vein is creative writing. Maybe you write a poem um, about how your intentions came about, or you write a short story detailing your life a year after your you know spell came to fruition, and you can talk about how it impacted your life how your life has been altered by your results. If you want a really, really interesting story on a uh, one magical practitioner who did do something similar and had it massively affect his life, look up Grant Morrison's experience of creating his comic, The Invisibles. Next is dance. Not only is dance a great creative way of physically expressing your intent outward, but it is also a really good way to raise energy and it can be done in praise of spirit. Again, if you are petitioning spirit in this working. And finally, literally anything creative, the possibilities here are endless and you know much better than I do what kind of creative pursuits that you personally enjoy, whether this is something that you do professionally or it's something that you just do as, you know, sort of a beginner's hobby. And whether it is, you know, fire dancing, glass blowing, leather working, sewing, singing, uh, playing the ukulele, playing the harp, playing the drums, uh, playing all of the instruments all at once, editing film, uh, creating, uh, I, I, I don't know. There's so many different scenarios that creativity can be used in spell work. There's so many different creative pursuits and artistic pursuits. Even if you you just like making homemade crafts, you know, decor to hang up around your house, there is a way you can include it into your spell work. Um, I always like to say when I'm talking about spells, get creative with it. So now 
get creative with your creativity. Get creative with how you use your creativity. <laughs> okay, there, I'm sure there's a better way to phrase that, but it's something like that. I would love to hear how you include creativity and art into your craft. Leave it down in the comments below. If you're looking for some more DIY projects to get your creativity flowing, you can check out this playlist right here.